Top of the time, tea time. Yeah, this is tea time. Yeah, making a difference. One cup at a time, tea time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time, time, time. making a difference. One cup at a time. Well, good morning and welcome to Tea Time. That's right. We're back here with a new week and some new guests. And this morning we are joined with Dr. Jeffrey Scales. That's right. We are joined with dermatologist Dr. Jeffrey Scales. And we are going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about skincare, cosmetics, medical, skin cancer, all of that good stuff. So grab your tea, grab your coffee, grab a glass of wine, grab whatever you'd like to drink this morning and join back and sit and enjoy Miss Liz's Tea Time. Because on Tea Time, you don't need to drink tea. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live show. Let's get that in there. And then let's get this incredible bio of this incredible man. And then we will serve some strong TEA dermatologist style. So disclaimer for Miss Liz's live Tea Time show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogue and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may mostly be at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect that, and I will see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea times this year are done on Thursday unless they are a rescheduled tea time. So be sure to check out. Thursday, we have three shows in the morning, afternoon, and evening. Now, let me introduce Dr. Jeffrey Scales. Dr. Jeffrey Scales is known, known to patients and staffs as Dr. Clearskin. He is a board-certified dermatologist with a private practice in Durham, the North Carolina Center for Dermatology, that offers cosmetic and medical services at the North North Carolina Center for Dermatology. Our philosophy is simple. Your care is the heart and soul of our practice. He has also produced a line of skincare products, Dr. Clear Skin, which we'll be talking about this morning on Tea Time. He has been practicing dermatology for 25 years and he has observed, observed that there are particular skin problems that affect people of color. This, disproportionately that have been neglected by the skincare community. He believes that his experience as an African-American dermatologist treating these problems has given him special insights on how to help those who suffer from them. He cultivated pro these products with plant-based ingredients to, to help those people with, the, with these problems. And again, Ms. Liz is starting to have 
issues reading. So I'm going to get Dr. Jeffrey in here and I'm going to grab a cup of tea, a sip of my tea, and we're going to sit and we're going to serve you a good tea. For the rest of Dr. Jeffrey uh, Scales bio, please check out Miss Liz's Facebook page. Let me get Dr. Jeffrey in here. Dr. Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you very much, Miss Liz. Thank you for having me. Yeah, these these little screens sometimes they get my eyes and then I get all like so <laughs> so welcome and it is a pleasure to have you here. So could you tell us a little bit about who you are, how you got into dermatology and all of that good stuff? Yes, uh, my name is Jeffrey Scales and I'm a dermatologist and I am originally from uh, born in the state of North Carolina and raised in the Washington DC area. I have had the great opportunity of living in several cities. I went to a, to school in Atlanta at Morehouse College, which was a very inspirational experience for me. I received my medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in Philadelphia. Then I trained originally in pediatrics at the University of Chicago. And from there, I practiced pediatrics for a number of years. And then I came back to train in dermatology at Wake Forest Baptist Hospital in North Carolina, my home state. And since then, I have launched a private practice. I've been here, good gracious, going on 25 years, 25 plus years. And I practice dermatology with a specialization on children and people of color and diseases in general of anyone in Durham, North Carolina, home of the Duke Blue Devils. So Dr. Jeffrey, what is a dermatologist? For the viewers out there that may not know what it is. Sure, so a dermatologist is a doctor that specializes in the care and treatment of the skin. It can involve the skin, the hair, the nails. So we spend a lot of time studying the skin, learning about the pathophysiology that comes up with the skin and ways to treat it and improve it. So Dr. Jeffrey, you, you mentioned that in your, in your bio, uh, black African Americans uh, suffer from skin care the most. Is there a reason for that? Um, perhaps you can rephrase that question. I don't think I understood it. Ask me that question one more time, please. Oh, okay. Uh, so in your, in your bio here, you mentioned about uh, the black African Americans suffering more with the, with the skin issues. Like I'm guessing because they don't put sunscreen on, correct? No, I think I have to parse that question in a couple pieces. So we'll save the sunscreen part to a little bit later, but let's talk okay. a little bit about what my thoughts were. My point in mentioning that is that the field of medicine in general has been a field that's been, has not escaped the realities of the society in which it's come from. So a good example I like to give is the field of OBGYN. Okay. Much of the medicine and the knowledge that comes from people who are, practice the field of OBGYN was performed on people of color and particularly enslaved people of color. And as a result, uh, knowledge was gained. But the focus that much of the, the medical world has had uh, over the previous century or so has been focusing primarily on diseases that affect people who tend to have what we call you know, lighter skin people. There are diseases that are common to, in the bulk of diseases are common to everyone, but they may have different appearances in people based upon how much melanin they have in their skin. And it's not necessarily a racial or ethnic issue. It has to do with a physiologic issue. It has to do with how much melanin a person has present in their skin. You could be from India, you could be from a Native American, you could be from South America, but people who have browner skin have had diseases that have, for the most part, been neglected by many of the established medical uh, medical institutions. And so part of what I do is I work on, with people on diseases that sometimes are not always given as much attention as they might be in the medical community. So at, at, your, at your clinic, uh, Dr. Jeffrey, do you focus mainly on certain issues like skin, skin issues or is it? I'm happy to see anybody. Yeah, every, every skin issue is the skin issue I work on. So if they have things I, I can work with and I can work with uh, any of the diseases. We have quite a, if you were to sit in my office and look at our waiting room, 
it reflects the community under which I serve. And so you have a wide range of people, disproportionate number of children, and the you know the diversity that exists around our community in a city like Durham, which is a you know reasonably cosmopolitan city in in North Carolina with several uh, institutions nearby. Uh, we have a very diverse looking population. I would dare say if you look at many other practices, that may not be the case. Uh, dermatology has not always been a field that has focused on being as inclusive uh, for all people as it possibly could be. Uh, there are certainly, there certainly is the browning of America and many of the diseases that present in certain skin types that are very light are going to appear different in skin that is darker. And oh. having the knowledge and the insight, the desire to make sure that you're prepared to manage these diseases in the range of people in this country is what I focus on. I don't purposely select to have a certain type of patient that comes to my office. We just happen to be an office that is welcoming to everyone and encourages everyone, regardless of ethnic background or socioeconomic backgrounds to come and to receive what we consider high quality medical care. So what got you into this field? Well, I was a pediatrician practicing for a number of years in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I liked practicing pediatrics, but I realized at the end of my training in pediatrics that I really enjoyed my last rotation, which was pediatric dermatology. I had the opportunity to train with a wonderful woman at Children's Memorial Hospital. And she was very helpful and, and very nice. And I just really was smitten by the specialty as I was finishing my training to be a general pediatrician. So I practiced for a number of years and then I got the great idea to consider going back to train a bit more. So I applied to a number of institutions and I interviewed at a, a number of them and was fortunate enough to land at Wake Forest Baptist Hospital. And I trained there with some wonderful people and have since stayed in the state of North Carolina. I have a wife that's a physician that works at the uh, UNC Chapel Hill. She's a pediatric emergency medicine specialist. So the two of us can practice medicine in a very nice environment. And that was the reason that I ventured down this path. So what has it taught you about yourself working in this field? Interesting question. I don't think anyone was ever asked that question. I think what it's taught me is that I have a particular, you know, people's minds work different ways. Some people, I think, are suited for certain types of work. I realize that I am most productive when I can work with people closely. I can see a number of problems that in a day that require quick decision making. Uh, I like the fact that it's a field that is almost always a problem that you can see. I'm very visually focused. I like art. I have a number of art pieces behind me that I like. I have artwork scattered throughout my office from local artists, some prints from <laughs> copies, let's say from Matisse. Matisse is one of my favorite artists. And so I, enjoy uh, visual things. And so having the opportunity to go out and to see patients that might require some attention and to have them come in and to be able to help them many times has been really rewarding for me. And I, I think we, we seem to always overlook a doctor. Like, why did the doctor get into this field, you know? And I think we need to understand, like, you, as you're sharing your, your answer here, Dr. Jeffrey, you're sharing about art and, you know, the love of the quick decision making and stuff like that. You know, sometimes we, we forget those little things and we just think doctor, right? Oh, we gotta go see the doctor. But the doctor also is a person. It is, a, you are an individual, you know, who have your qualities and your passions and hobbies and that as well. And that's why I asked you that question is because we sometimes forget, you know, to ask the higher professionals like, like yourself, Dr. Jeffries, who you are and why you got there. So I think now- yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because sometimes I'll have patients call me 
late in the day or in the evening where they'll find out I've been on vacation. And I said, yeah, I was on vacation last week. I couldn't see you, but I can see this week. And I said, you know, you go on vacation as if all I do is sit in this office waiting for them to come <laughs> and wait for them to make a phone call. So I, uh, I do think it is uh, funny sometimes. When, and you talk about vacations and uh, here I have that you've traveled quite a bit. You've traveled to Jamaica, Cuba, Puta Canda, Bermuda. So you, you like to travel those hot lands, correct? I like warm weather. That's why I live in North Carolina. If you don't like warm weather, it's not the right state for you. I've lived in colder climates before. I've lived in Chicago, Illinois, right on the lake. And you learn what cold really means. You learn words like lake affects snow, uh, things like that, which uh, you would not normally get if you were living, say, in North Carolina. Yes, I like to travel. I like to see different places. I, I do like to go and ski. I do ski. I've skied in Colorado and Utah. Arizona, um, New Mexico, uh, places like that, um, I, West Virginia. So I do get out to cool weather places, but I like warm weather places most. I feel like it gives you the flexibility of being able to go out and see things. If it's cold and snowy, I generally don't want to go out unless I'm going to be skiing. So I've traveled some in Europe as well, and I will be going to Italy and Sicily in just a few weeks. So I spent time in, uh, let's see, uh, France, Italy. We're headed to, as I said, Italy again. Um, been to Germany, been to Austria, Salzburg, Austria. I absolutely love that, that, that city and that country. So I like to get out and see things. Yes, it's a great blessing. Canada was one of my favorite places. I've been to Toronto and Montreal. I was, that was a wonderful trip. I love Canada when it's warm. <laughs> when it's, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to come right now. Now it's cold. It, I went last night for a walk in the storm with my son and his girlfriend and boy, was it cold. So yes, not the place through that storm. I love storm walking. I, there's just something really empowering about storm walking. He says storm walking. Is that you mean you walk in the midst of a storm? Yeah, the storm is out there. It's blizzarding. It's blowing. It's cold. And we just walk through it and, and we just show that we can get through the storm, right? So it plays with okay, that's Now that's a new word for me. I have done the same thing. I absolutely love, if it's snowing heavily, I love going out, putting my boots on, making sure I'm warm and just walking as the snow blows. That's one of my favorite things to do. Now we don't get to do it very much here in North Carolina, but now I know, storm walking. Okay, I'm gonna put that down as one of my hobbies. Yeah, it's just empowering, right? Cause you get, you do that walk and you get home, you have your nice hot cup of tea or a hot cider or a coffee, you know, and it just, empowers the mindset that you've gone and it's, through. There's a beauty the to the snow in a way that's different than any other weather phenomenon. Walking the rain is very different than walking in the snow. Snow is quiet. It's beautiful. Yeah. It calms the noise. It calms the mind. I just find it incredibly peaceful. I walk for miles and miles when it snows here, uh, yeah. mo mo mostly by myself, uh, just relaxing the mind. It's a form of meditation. So I think it's a good time to ask you, Dr. Jeffries, if I ask you what your tea is, what three words would you give me today? Sure. So I was thinking about this and you came up with tea. So I'll start with tea. Uh, the, the word T-E-A, I'll start with the letter T. Uh, I think the word tea for me would be transition. And when I say that, I, you've asked me uh, several questions about practicing medicine. Mm -hmm. and, but part of what you've heard me mention both in my bio and in some of the things I've mentioned is the importance of making sure that we empower, well, that's my E, I'll get to that in my, but making sure that we are moving our society towards a more just, fair, and equitable society. So I consider some of what I do as being helping in a transition. My daughter's going to medical school at the University Green of Pennsylvania again. in July and one of the things I have talked to her about medicine is that as a physician, particularly a physician of color, part of what you're doing is you're the fair arbiter. You're make, you're equalizing things that are not necessarily equal in society when it comes to medicine. So when a person walks in my office, they are going to be treated respectfully, regardless of race, ethnicity, um, gender, uh, sexual choice. Because all people deserve quality, non-judgmental medical care. And you know, as I say, medicine, like any other business, specialty, calling, 
is a reflection often of the people who are from the society around it. And there are these health inequities that exist in our society for many different groups of people. I don't know if that exists in Canada. My suspicion is that it does because it exists throughout most of the world. So part of what I do is I'm here to make sure that we can level some of the uneven uh, playing fields that people play have to play with out in society. So transitioning, helping to transition our society, hopefully long after, hopefully while I'm here, but it'll probably happen long after I'm gone to a more equitable and uh, hopeful and welcoming society. The E stands for empowerment. So uh, I consider, again, providing health care as a way of empowering people to live their best lives, to maximize their options. If you're a person at home scratching and bleeding, as I saw a couple of patients today who are unable to sleep, they can't live the lives that they need to live as a result of the diseases they have. So helping them to return to their to a normal life is really re rewarding to me. And I think that part of what I'm doing is I'm helping that. Secondly, empowering people who are from groups that traditionally are not given as much opportunity. Again, I have a daughter who's going to be going to medical school and she has gotten a wonderful scholarship and will be doing very well at the University of Pennsylvania. It's a, it's a Ivy League medical school and it had the first surgical amphitheater and it's very prestigious. And I, uh, it's nice to see her follow in the same alma mater that my wife and I went to. Um, but part of what I told her is that she has responsibility to speak to people and encourage people around her who look at her and see possibilities. Part, I've had people actually bring their children to see me to say that I want you to take a look at him because he's a African-American doctor. Because from where they come, that's not something that they have ever seen. And so they look and now they see possibilities. And so her responsibility as well as my responsibility is to remind people that you can do exactly what, what we have done and that the possibilities exist. And finally, a is advocacy. And I think that I've probably covered some of that in my first two letters, but I want to be, an, I am an advocate and want to continue to be an advocate for opportunity for all, for equity for all, for good health care for all, and for the opportunity for people to develop in the society and to maximize their talents on an equal basis with anyone well, thank you for that. That's a, really, that's a really, really strong tea, Dr. Jeffries. And I, I, I'm with you with that. You know, we we have a role to play. We have to set an example. You know, we can give people the opportunities to believe in their dreams as well instead of shooting them down. So I want to really thank you for that. And, and encouraging your daughter to be that voice, you know, because we need to have that voice for the younger generation out there to say, you know what, if you want to be a doctor when you grow up, don't don't discourage a child, you know, say, you know what, go for it. You know, work hard for it, do it, be determined, you know, have the discipline. Uh, we really start need to really encourage our children and the younger generation and all ages and all walks of life, you know, that you, you can do it if you put the work into it. You just got to put the hard work into it. So thank you for that message. Really, really appreciate that message. So I want to get into a little bit of the skincare products that you've created. What got you into creating products for, for the skin? Well, I am very fortunate to have had an opportunity to have been exposed to a number of great skincare products and skincare lines over the years. But what I have focused on are shaving difficulties that occur with people, oftentimes people with very curly and difficult uh, hair in the beard area and the scalp and in the private area, uh, underarms and things. Many of us, almost everyone shaves at some point. And there are shaving problems that occur that can be really problematic for some. I've seen a number of people who have had difficulty with shaving on the face and they'll end up with scarring, permanent scarring, all sorts of things as a result of not being able to manage it as well. So the skincare line I've come up with, Dr. Clear Skin, has some products in it that can help minimize the complications that might come from shaving. This can be for ladies in the bikini area, men on the face, perhaps the scalp, uh, the neck, um, they are designed to 
keep the challenging things that occur with shaving to a minimum. So when you're talking about the scarring of shaving and all of that, Dr. Jeffries, is it because we're not shaving properly and we're not aware of how to shave correctly? Like what causes all of that scarring and ingrown hairs and all of that good stuff? Well, it's an anatomical issue. So if you were to look at a person with a background from Asia, that's very long, straight hair, the hair sh shaft, the part of the skin that makes hair is very straight. And so the hair consequently grows out of the skin straight with very few opportunities to grow back in the skin and to lead to inflammation. With Caucasian people, it tends to be more elliptical. And in people of color, it tends to be more like a corkscrew. And so if you were to cut the hair very short in all three of those patients, the likelihood of having inflammation from hair that turns back into the skin, escapes the skin and then turns back into the skin is greatest in the, the person that has the corkscrew hair. So as a result, I have chosen a, a few things that people can use in an effort to try to minimize that. Okay. In those same patients where they've had the hair that turns back in, they may get secondary infection and scarring. And so a person may go from having just some shaving difficulties to now having some permanent scarring in areas that can be quite challenging. The second thing is that as a result of shaving with more challenging hair, with the corkscrew hair, you can end up with inflammation that ultimately ends up with extra pigmentation. So you'll see people with darker areas of, of melanin where they have had uh, to shave frequently. And so, again, these products are designed to tr try to help minimize some of these complications that occur. So when they put this cream on that you've, uh, you've created, Dr. Jeffries, it, it, it takes away the scarring or it lightens it? Like, what does it do? No, what it does is it tries to minimize the likelihood that these hairs are going to return to this and, and oh. turn back into the skin. It does, it's not a medical treatment. It's a way of a, a multi-step process that tries to keep, again, people from having the complications that lead to the problem in the first place. The things that you mentioned, scarring and difficulty are things that need to be addressed by a physician. Okay. So is there a, a certain name for this? Like, like a doctor's term? No. Sure. So if you were to have difficulty with shaving on the face, the term that we like to use is pseudofolliculitis barbie. It's a three letter word. It's obviously Latin. Um, it just essentially means it's almost pseudo um, like inflammation. Uh, and it happens barbie in the beard area. There's a complication that happens on the back of the head, which is the same where people get their hair trimmed and they will get the same complication, but it has a different name. It's called acne keloidalis nuke that many times can lead to scarring. It's relatively common. And for ladies and anyone that shaves the rest of their body, you can have difficulty in the axilla, the underarms, and the private area. And the term we would probably use for that would just be folliculitis. So again, these products have been curated in such a way that they can assist with keeping that to a minimum, keeping the complications to a minimum. So we have a question here for you, Dr. Jeffries. Is this cream put on before shaving or after shaving? There's both. So I have a, I'll talk about the shaving difficulty with the beard. Uh, there are a couple things you would do. First, you would have a, you cleanse the skin and you use an abrasive uh, scrub on the face and you put a pre-shave oil on, which helps decrease the friction as a result of shaving. And then you apply shave cream over the oil. You shave with hopefully a fresh blade. Then afterwards, there's some moisturizer that includes a retinoid. A retinoid is a type of vitamin A cream that you apply to the skin that has been shown in some studies to decrease inflammation and decrease the likelihood of having shaving complications. So it's a multi-step process that helps to shave. I think most of us, if you think about it, we're all taught to shave in some way or another, be it your legs or your face. And it's something that's really common and has a number of complications that occur as a result of unwanted hair removal. And we're all going to continue to shave. But the point being that sometimes people just take a little, 
I, I talk to lace often who take a razor and they put a little soap on their skin and they just shave themselves. Considering the complications that occur, I don't think that's enough effort putting into preparing for that moment. And the same thing with the beard. I'm not one that advocates many, many, many steps, but I think having a multi-step process to this activity of shaving will help prevent some of the problems that come as a result of shaving. If you think about it, you're taking a sharp blade and running it across your skin. What if the skin is not smooth? What if the skin is inflamed? You know, what if you have some difficulty here from having had previous complications with shaving? It should be more than just a little soap or a little shave cream and you know, grabbing a blade that you've used a couple of times and running it across your skin, especially for an area of the body that's seen so easily. The face is seen by everyone. So I think it needs a little more investment of time and effort to keep you looking at your best. So we have a question here about hair under the chin for women. What causes that? Well, it's a normal phenomenon. I think it's culturally for most ladies is not considered something acceptable. Uh, we do have patients who occasionally will have some sort of hormone imbalance that makes them grow hair more than others. But I often tell my patients that if you have, grow hair well on your head, you're going to grow it well on other parts of your body as well. Typically, mid-20s later, women start to grow more hair on their face than they did previously. And somehow, I think many of people have been led to believe that women don't grow hair on their face. Uh, they certainly do, and they always have. And there are ways to address it. I find a lot of women use tweezers and yank hair, hairs out of their face, skin. That can lead to significant complications and significant permanent scarring. So there are ways to address it. It's interesting to me, the number of people I meet who are very happy shaving their arms and their legs, but would never shave their chin. Yet, they consider it a masculine uh, event to do such a thing, but you're just removing hair. And if you're prepared to remove hair in other areas, certainly the face is in need at times. And so I don't ever think of it as being different, but psychologically for many of them, it, it is quite different. So uh, I try to provide, again, this product line, Dr. Clear Skin, uh, getdrclearskin.com is the website. I try to provide products that can keep some of those complications that can occur in all those areas to a minimum. So uh, Dr. Jeffrey, how do you feel about the a product that removes the hair? Like you put it on and, and then you just wipe it off. I think it's a great choice. You know, I try not to tell people how to remove hair. Uh, if we were to list the numbers of options, they would include things like shaving, chemical removers, as you mentioned, yep. uh, electrolysis, waxing, laser hair removal. Uh, the chemical remover can be quite good. It keeps you from having to apply any sharp surface to your skin. What you will find occasionally, though, is that it may not be effective enough in some areas. You may also find that some people have irritation on their skin as a result of having used these. So you see people with contact dermatitis or redness or swelling that has occurred as a result of using these products, uh, which lead, can lead to a, another skin problem, such as inflammation that leads to extra pigmentation in the skin. So I think they're great products. They can be a little dicey on the face, but certainly appropriate for the face. And they work well in the lower parts of the body. And how do you feel about waxing? I think waxing is a great choice too. Uh, you can develop some of the same complications. A person has to go somewhere else and they have to allow someone to apply this wax to their face. You can end up sometimes with some complications as a result of inflammation, or maybe the wax is a little too strong, or some of the components in the wax may be irritating or allowing someone to be allergic to it. So um, I think it's a great option. I have no problems with it. I think it can work well. So we have a question here. I'm guessing people are checking your website out. So what is the N N NCCD collection? Ah, yes. So the name of my practice in North Carolina is the North Carolina Center for Dermatology. So we have some products that we highlight in the medical practice that's slightly different than the uh, shaving products that we mentioned. So, for instance, I just happen to have here a bottle of uh, 
sunscreen. You mentioned sunscreen earlier. If I can figure yes. out how to use the camera. And this is a sunscreen I think can be good for, for many people. It can be particularly good for people of color. You may find that, uh, certainly have, there are studies to support this, that while we talk about skin cancer and, skin, and sun protection for the population in general, there are subgroups of the population that have been, have not been, have not gotten the lesson that they need to consider using sunscreens as well. Sunscreens are important when you're outside and you're getting a lot of sun exposure. Uh, they don't look the same in everyone. So if I have a very light skin and I put on a really thick cream that looks very white, uh, it's not very noticeable. If my skin is very dark and I put a cream on, looks something like house paint and I look yeah. very gray and greasy, uh, that's not something I'm probably going to do very much. So I think consequently, many people of color have not considered using sunscreen. Secondly, we don't talk about skin cancer as as often in people of color as we do in other people. The risk of skin cancer in people with browner skin is a fraction of what it would be in, say, a person that has very light skin, a Caucasian person, for instance, but it's not zero. And when it occurs, it tends to occur at a later stage. I think oftentimes because people are not being screened appropriately, I think sometimes Certain physicians are not considering it, and it certainly can look different in people of color than it might in a person whose skin is lighter. So I include among the collection a sunscreen. We have wonderful moisturizers and cleansers and scrubs, and so we offer a range of very nice products that can be used to uh, make you feel good and help your skin. It's different. So Dr. Clear Skin product line. So Dr. Jeffrey, does any of your products have coconut in it? I don't recall if any of them do off the top of my head. I'd have to go through the list, but I am not aware of any that do right now. Well, that's good to know because I'm allergic to coconuts. <laughs> sure. Well, we would have some other things for you. You don't have to have coconut. So we have a question here. What are the symptoms of skin cancer? I think, you know, skin cancer, it can be, you know, I'll use the word skin cancer as an umbrella term, it in involves many different types of cancer. Depending on where in the skin it occurs, decides how it looks, how it behaves. Many times a skin cancer can be a spot that doesn't heal. That's a really common finding. A person will say, I've had this place on my face and it just, it bleeds when I wash my face. And uh, it's been that way for six months. Okay, your skin shouldn't bleed when you wash your face, unless you're doing something really abrasive to it. Um, and it should certainly, if you were to bleed a bit, it should stop very quickly within a week or, or less. So persistent places that don't heal. Growing moles in a way that are not like the other moles. Rapid growth of things. It takes a trained eye to try to determine which spots are the ones that we need to pay attention to. Uh, that's why you can go to see a skin doctor there in Canada or here. Sometimes it's very obvious, many times it's not. If you're at the point where you're having significant symptoms, like itching, burning, bleeding, pain, that, that's not a good prognosis. So if you have doubts about anything, certainly you can look at things online, but even there, it can be hard to determine. I think people have decided that uh, Dr. Google is capable of giving them the same level of care. I don't think it is. So even for the people who spend their lifetimes looking at these things, it can be complicated. So I always tell people, if you need doubt, just let the doctor take a look and they can help you decide whether it's something to, to be worried about. Or not. Well, and I'm glad that you brought up Dr. Google because Dr. Google puts a lot of panic into a lot of people because they, they usually see the C word on almost everything. If you do Dr. Google, you know, cancer comes up a lot when you do with Dr. Google. Yeah, I will say, I tell people it's Google's a wonderful invention, and now we've got chat, GPT, and other things that are coming. It's not a substitute for a medical professional, and it cannot train you to do certain things. I always give an example to someone. People will come to me and say, that I looked at something on Google, and this is what it says, and so I think this is what it is. And I'll ask them, if I went online and found some plans for a bridge, and I got the materials and went out and built the bridge over the highway where I near my office, would you drive your car across that highway? 
on that bridge? And the answer should be no, because I'm not an engineer. I may have the plans. I may have the steps. It doesn't mean I know what I'm doing. It doesn't mean I'm capable of, of completing any of the, the tasks. I would not drive myself over the bridge, and I wouldn't expect them to do the same. There are certain levels of knowledge that just can't be gained by someone with a push of a button and search engine optimization that ranks the top five of whoever's really good at doing that and paying their money to get it done. That's a substitute for people that know things. So, you know, I can go online. I can learn about how to play basketball. doesn't mean I'm going to be a great basketball player. So I think people have deceived themselves into thinking that they are more capable of doing certain things than they are be it medicine or many other things. And so I think there's a degree of humility we need to have about what we're able to do, which we seem to have lost uh, as a result of what we can see from a Google search. Exactly. I always tell my kids, leave it to the professionals. You know, we all have these different uh, fields of work and that there's a reason we have doctors. There's a reason why we have nurses, you know, the, and not just medical, the medical field, that's any field. You know, any I, field, right? Yeah. I, I couldn't learn to be a great actor by going online and learning things I learned about acting. I would not go out and win an, an Oscar award for some performance. It's just not possible. There's expertise I have to learn from people who know what they're doing. And somehow we've gotten to the point where we think we're so capable of being able to do things that are not easy. Everyone doesn't play in the NBA. You can learn all the, <laughs> all the steps that you need to know about how to do it, but it doesn't mean you're able to do it or able to do it well or even capably. So I I think it's, when it comes to medicine, I think people oftentimes find that, that they think they have that. I would hope they wouldn't believe they're able to learn to do some of those other things I talked about, like to be a structural engineer or to be a pro basketball player. But I, at this point now with Google and what is <laughs> talking scary. about, I'm not sure anymore, <laughs> I'm just not sure. Well, it, it seems like the mindset is, I want easy. I don't want to work hard for it. I don't want to put the work into it. I just want easy. And I think that's where a lot of people are going with Google and the G and the chat GPT and all that. They just want simple, but they're not understanding. It's a the very process. powerful thing. Well, if you think about it, it's a very powerful thing to have. What would take me hours to do in the library? People don't remember the card catalog. You may be too young to remember it, but you'd have to look up something on a little card and go down with a bunch of dusty books and find a book and hopefully find the right page. Hope the book was there and find it. You can find now in less than a second. And that's a really powerful thing, but it doesn't, it's not a substitute for knowledge. Discovering something that's been put through Google is not, and going to a website of unknown authorship, an unknown source, is not a substitute for knowledge and wisdom and experience under any circumstance. So as I said, I think we're, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. So we have a question here for you, Dr. Jeffries. They want to know how long it took you to go to school for a derm to be a dermatologist. That's a great question. So I, I went through high school, 18 years. Then I had four years of college afterwards, at which point I'm 22. Then I had four years of medical school after that. In my case, I had two residencies afterwards, but usually it's one residency. So if, for instance, if I wanted to go after, uh, go straight into dermatology instead of going to pediatrics and then dermatology, I would have gone from medical school to a four-year residency, which is really a form of apprenticeship. And then you're able to be ready to know something about dermatology and then the real learning begins which is the experience and the exposure that comes the wisdom that comes from having seen things over time books are great and it's important to know those but you need to have a certain element of knowledge that comes from having seen things repetitively fortunately in medicine it's one of the fields that the more senior people in the field are held in in high esteem because they often have seen things that many younger people have not yet and may see in the future. So it gives them a certain insight that you would not get just because you've looked at things in a book. And you've been in this so, field for so I, you, At the earliest, I think I left that out. So let's see, 26. So if you started like I did and you went straight through, which not everyone does, but if you go straight through, you're talking about, you're probably finished when you're about 30. 
in my case, I took a number of years. I had another three years. I added on top of the the uh, three. So I had six years after I finished my um, medical degree for the two residencies I did. So I probably started practicing dermatology when I was about 35. Wow. See, it takes a lot of work, a lot of determination, and I'm sure it was not an easy thing to do at some times. You know, some moments you were like, oh, my goodness, what am I doing? You know, that's absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely true. But what I've told people about medicine, I think medicine is when you feel that you have to have a different perspective on life. You have to be prepared to invest a certain amount of time in the beginning so that you can have something that you want later on. I'm not saying there's anything, you know, tremendously great or fantastic about it, but it's a field that requires you to have a different mindset. So as I have told my daughter again, who's starting, she's 22 this week, I said, you'll have friends in a year or two who are out in the Caribbean while you're sitting in some cold library somewhere studying <laughs> and paying a lot of money to do so in an effort to do things. You may start some of the phases of your life later, but when you do, you have some options that others may not have. You generally have to like what you're doing or else it can be really hard to yeah. so choose something among, you know, specialties among the field that or something you like. So I'd love listening to people lecture about dermatology. I could go, I go to meetings. I sit in dark rooms with slides and important people uh, lecturing to me and others. And I could do that eight to five, uh, you know, five straight days. Now afterwards, I want to go to the beach or maybe I want to go ski or maybe I want to go with my wife out to sightsee. I like to balance it. I mean, I spend the whole day doing that, but I find that really pleasurable. I love science and I love um, math, although math doesn't come into this field. But there's also a beauty about the visual aspects of taking care of people that I really like. I think that's why I like art and learning about things like that. That's very much a right brain type of phenomenon. But I, I think of dermatology as a, as a primarily left brain field, but there's a certain right brain aspect to it as well. Well, I think in dermatology is almost like art, right? Because you're removing and you're adding and you're putting the product, you're removing the product. You know, it's like creating a, an art piece, you know, put a little bit of cream, add a little water, you know, like mm -hmm. you're playing with that. It's almost like you're doing your own masterpiece, right? It's a piece of art. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's the way we look at it in a different mindset. Like, like you said, Dr. Jeffries, we need that, a different mindset when we get into these fields, you know, we, sure. if, if you're not, if you're, if you're very sure, a person that needs quick feedback for anything, that's not the right field. In fact, if anything, I discourage people for going into it. There are times at which there are people out living a life with children and homes and cars and businesses, and you are still working long hours at relatively low pay. And uh, it may be hard to start your life a little later, particularly if you want to have a lot of children, depending on when you want to start. Uh, it may be a fuel that may make that much more difficult to do. So we have a question here. You've been in this field for 25 years. What have you seen in the changes in the 25 years of dermatology? Oh, oh I can go on for hours for that. So I think that some of the great, some of the most impressive things, so I'm going to include impressive and noteworthy things that I have seen over the years is that the introduction of a lot of new science into the field has led to treatments for people who had really debilitating diseases. I don't know if they do it in Canada. I assume that they do like they do here, but you have all these commercials for various medications that they have all sorts of fancy names and things. But I remember when I first started in dermatology, there was a special treatment center we had for a disease called psoriasis. Psoriasis affects 2% of the population generally across all sorts of racial, ethnic, and gender lines. But we had what was considered a state-of-the-art treatment center there at the time. So a person would come and they would plan to be there about three weeks. They would live in a hotel and they would come in in the morning at 8 a.m. and they would uh, get all sorts of tar put on them. They would take their clothes off and stand in front of lights. They would have this little thing that looked like a little car wash that they would use on their heads. And that was state-of-the-art therapy. And they would do that day after day, five days a week. And they'd have to leave their families, leave their jobs, and engage in this. And that was great for them. It didn't cure them, but it made them better for many weeks. 
and they'd go home with some topical medicines and maybe some things they would take. Now you have medications that people can take that are injections and pills, but primarily injections you see on TV, where someone can have an injection done maybe once every two weeks, maybe once a month, maybe once every three months. That completely clears them. That makes it so that they can live lives that are no different than anyone else. It's not always perfect, but it can be very close. And that's stunning to me. That's just amazing to me that you have this level of science that can go in and target specific things and change them. That's also taking place with another disease that's really common called atopic dermatitis. Again, these are these are medical uh, diagnoses that, uh, again, I find very interesting, but we look at how they affect people's lives. There are people that can work now that couldn't work before. There are people whose joints are not being attacked by disease processes that are stopped as a result of these medicines. A lot of these medications are entirely too expensive and they are very profitable for the companies which they uh, that make these things. And that's very disappointing in many ways, but they are miraculous. They are life-changing. They have changed the quality of life of thousands and thousands of people, both here in North America and around the world. And yes, we have to come up with another way of perhaps funding them and giving access to them because they're not given equally to people in need. But they are just stunning and amazing uh, things. Yeah, you know, and to step into a controversial topic, I'll just give my two cents for a moment here. But uh, the introduction of COVID into the modern world, regardless of where it came from, that's of some debate right now, regardless of whether people actually believe it exists, it certainly did because it killed thousands and millions of people. If you had ever told me <laughs> as, a, as a, an adult that people wouldn't believe people are dying of a disease that's right in their community and dying in large numbers, I, I would have been astounded. But that's an entirely separate conversation. It goes to show the some of the psychopathology that exists in in uh, the general public. But uh, the idea that this disease came and someone was able to come up with a way of diagnosis, diagnosing it, then treating it and giving a vaccine uh, and changing the quality of life of people in such a short time is astounding to me. I mean, here it is. Uh, they started restricting things in March of 2020, and I'm sitting here in March of 2023 without a mask, walking most places without a mask, without being concerned about it. Uh, after what we've been through, it's just absolutely amazing. People have asked, well, how is it that they could come up with these treatments so fast? They can't be very good because they didn't take long enough. Well, some of the best scientists in the world were given a blank check to investigate this and to work on things in ways that weren't possible years ago. The science and technology we have now for medicine in many ways is just astounding the level of knowledge people have and continue to, to gain. That's how you're able to do things like that. If you have thousands of people at the top scientists in the world all focusing on one disease. Right now, as it's gotten better, people have gone back to working on breast cancer and brain cancer and you know cold sores and all sorts of other things. But when that was happening, people were able to focus and to develop. And it was just an absolutely miraculous process. And so it was so interesting to see how uh, something could come to be. But nothing quite like that in dermatology, but these diseases that they're able to to help now are so much better than uh, they used to be. So there are still diseases to to treat and still diseases to come and new diseases come. It's another thing I think that's very interesting. People don't get the disease. New things can't come, only old things. And it's a very natural process that there's ebbs and flows of different types of diseases. There's a development of new diseases. That's part of the natural cycle of biology. That's been that way long before we were around. So it's when people ask about some of the things I've seen, uh, all those things I mentioned so far are great. Eczema, psoriasis, cancer treatment, the survival rate for melanoma has gotten much better. Uh, the survival rate for squamous cell carcinoma has gotten much better. The ability to diagnose things, to see things, in the body. Um, again, this doesn't relate specifically to dermatology, but the devices they have that can image the inside of the body now are astounding. Um, I unfortunately, well, I unfortunately got diagnosed with cancer a few years ago, and I had some imaging studies done and some treatment done that's completely cured the cancer. It was prostate cancer. And the technology they used, the devices they used were 
absolutely amazing. The laser technologies, the, the ability to, to image things were, are just, you know, something out of science fiction. So all those things help. Again, if you get diagnosed with melanoma or something else, again, those are things that can help image uh, and make sure they know where the disease is. Uh, all those things are, are just astounding. The vaccines for all sorts of things. There were diseases when I practiced pediatrics that were very common that don't even exist. People don't even see measles anymore. They don't even know what measles was. Yeah, <laughs> you mentioned that and you're like, what is that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the average doctor that's practiced pediatrics has never seen measles. They've never seen measles. They've never seen chicken pox. They've never seen mumps. These were things that we got routinely as children growing up that were normal. You're supposed to get those things. Yeah. Now, there are complications that came with it, like people losing their hearing and people uh, dying from these diseases. I've seen people die from chicken pox, children die from chicken pox and die from measles. But these things just don't even exist at any real level anymore. And the vaccines and the, the capacity to, to help with that, you just eradicated diseases that were scourges of 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 early childhood diseases. Polio is another example. We never saw polio. I was fortunate enough never to be exposed. My father-in-law got polio. He walks with a limp and he's been crippled since he got it. That was something that would affect people tremendously. Any child could get polio and die relatively fast. And it wasn't as a result of anything going wrong. It just was the normal function. And I think we've become quite spoiled yep. as a society in general, about what they, the expectations are and what it used to be. When people are afraid of these things, I wondered, would they prefer to have the diseases? Would you prefer your child to have polio instead of having a polio vaccine? Would you prefer your child to have measles and have having the measles vaccine? People survive many of them, but not everyone does. And not everyone survives it and comes out normal on the other side. So I think um, all these things have just been incredibly interesting, incredibly interesting to me. And as I'm winding my career down, I plan to cont continue practicing for a number of years, but uh, I just find it really exciting. It's been great. So any final words before we wrap up your tea? We're, we're just going along this morning. The uh, one hour is almost over and I've, I'm learning so much incredible facts and my viewers and listeners are really impressed with what you're sharing, uh, Dr. Jeffries, because with, this is what we need. We need the education. We need the information. You know, we need to bring that awareness. Uh, and you've brought some really good things to the table this morning with your tea. Uh, so any final words that you would like uh, the listeners to know about dermatology? Sure. I will give a plug for the field. I think dermatology is an amazing field of medicine and practice. I'm very fortunate to have, been, had, to have had the opportunity to have been trained and to be able to bring some of these um, skills that I've been taught uh, to uh, some of my patients. Um, I think it's really exciting. Anyone considering going to the field of medicine should consider dermatology. Now, I will tell you, dermatology has become one of the most popular specialties to, to engage in. Uh, it can be practiced full-time and part-time. Uh, you generally don't have any nights when you're out of the hospital, out of the house. Uh, you can have a regular life. And so I think it's a great opportunity, particularly for people that want a family life. I look forward to being able to consider continue to uh, see my patients and to take care of them. I, there's nothing as rewarding to me in what I do in my life as to have the opportunity to help people to live more normal lives. I have patients that have said wonderful things to me after having helped them with, with their cancer or with their psoriasis or disease to be able to go back to being a normal life, to be able to date. A perfect example I mentioned was psoriasis earlier, where people were getting those treatments. People walk around and literally skin drops off of their body and falls in the plate and falls over the floor. I mean, if we're not treated, and that really affects how people can interact. Some of them become reclusive and they become, they don't date, they don't have families. Uh, to be able to offer people an opportunity to go back to a normal life, to sleep all night without scratching and leaving blood on the bed and all sorts of things is been incredibly rewarding. I'm incredibly humbled by the opportunity I've had to uh, work with people and to see this wonderful field of, uh, develop right before me. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for sitting and having tea with me this morning. Uh, I really had a pleasure getting to speak with you. And I, had, I really want to thank the supporters and the 
people, the, the viewers out there that are sending in questions for all of these incredible tea times. We will be back this afternoon with a second tea time with Mona Baker from the United States as well. And she'll be talking about action omatics. That's right. We're going back into those omatics. Uh, last week we had septum symptomatics now we're having action omatics and it's about the movement she's a former ballet dancer in the american ballet theater so it should be a really interesting tea time to tune into this afternoon at three so again dr jeffries thank you so much for joining me this morning for an incredible tea time on dermatology skin care skin cancers all of that incredible stuff i really enjoyed um and i i believe we brought in some really incredible information and awareness to these topics as well. So again, thank you. Don't leave. I'm just going to wrap up the live and then we're going to say our final goodbyes in the backstage. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in and I will see everybody for a second show this afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you.